Yo, hell yeah. Wyatt begins in like uh, five, four, three, two, one. Yo, welcome to Wyatt, and I'm your host, Wyatt O'Brien Evans. Grrr, whoop, God damn it, woof, 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 woof. Hi, I said hi to all my YouTubers out there. If you like what you hear, if you like what you see, just click that subscribe button at the bottom of your screen. And because I know you loves me, leave me some likes and leave me some comments as well. Today's Wyatt provides a fascinating look into gay life from the 1940s through the 1970s. Our special guest is Hugh Hagius. He's the creator of the popular Old School Gays YouTube channel. He's also the author of G.I. Hustlers of World War II. So... Let's go back. Let's go back. 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 In time. So without further ado, Wyatt, I said Wyatt, welcomes journalist, historian, author, and popular YouTuber Hugh Hagius. Talk at me. How the hell are you? I'm doing real good, Wyatt. How are you? I am doing great. Listen, Hugh, thank you so much for dropping by Wyatt. You know, I am really excited to have you here today because I am a history buff. Uh, when I was growing up, I was, you know, looking at documentaries and just so into culture and history. And I found your fascinating YouTube channel. It's titled old school gaze and it does such a remarkable insightful job about presenting dissecting and analyzing gay life in the 20th century so my first question to you my friend is what was your particular motivation for creating this content that channel well uh, i have been interested in gay history for a long time and I was uh, writing books and self-publishing the books, mm -hmm. and they had some circulation, but I wanted to talk to more people, and mm -hmm. YouTube is a way to do it. So I, mm -hmm. uh, I figured out how to put a, a clip on YouTube and mm -hmm. uh, put a clip together. It was a, a little bit of, uh, of figuring out the technical part of it, but, uh, but I, I enjoyed it, and so now I'm doing it. And you do it really, really well because it's really resonating, Hugh, with so many people because um, some people that I know watch it religiously. So thank you for that. You're doing a great job. Um, oh, I'm so glad to hear that. Oh, definitely, definitely. What we're going to do today, if we can, is to, I want to talk about three of the videos that I really find fascinating. Then we're going to delve into one of your books because you're an author, and that book is called G.I. Hustlers of World War II. And then we're going to talk about aging in the LGBTQ plus community because that is such an issue. And a lot of times it gets like swept under the rug. People don't want to talk about it. And, you know, we're going to all age, so I don't get that. But we'll talk about that. Yes. Okay, but if we're lucky, we all read. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, you know, look, right now, though, we're going to travel down the corridors of time because my Wyatt audience is nosy. They they like to know the guest backstory because, as they say, inquiring minds want to know. So are you ready, my friend? I am ready. To take that walk Far with away. me. Okay. So where were you born and raised? I was born in Kansas, and I was grew up in Wyoming, mm -hmm. and in in little towns and in the country, way, uh, like twenty five miles outside of town, just sagebrush mm -hmm. and cactus and coyotes. Uh, oh. It was oil fields. I wasn't. Uh, we weren't a cowboy family. We were. My father worked in the oil fields, mm -hmm. and so there were oil derricks all around, but mm -hmm. there were uh, lots of uh, uh, hikes 
and lots of Indian petroglyphs, lots of rattlesnakes. It was a lot of fun, uh, but I, all that went fine until I hit uh, my adolescence. And uh, I was kind of like not taking the same path as the other guys that I knew. Oh. They were getting real interested in girls, and I wasn't. Uh, and so, uh, so that was something that puzzled me. I didn't know what to think about it. But I was a good little boy. I was an altar boy. And I thought, well, uh, it would be cool to be a, a priest or a missionary or something like that. So when I was 14, I went to a seminary. And I was there for six years, through, from 14 to 20. By the time I was 20, I knew it wasn't for me. But uh, still, it was a, a beautiful place. Um, uh, there were, it was a, a, an abbey in, in Oregon called Mount Angel. And there were like 150 monks and uh, a lot of singing and chanting every day and a lot of Latin. We learned Latin in the morning and we learned Latin at night because this was in the 1950s before the, uh -huh. uh, the Catholic Church switched to vernacular mass. Everything was still in Latin. So we had to know the Latin. So, uh, so I, I learned lots of Latin at, at Mount Angel. Let when me, I was 20, I, let, I departed, decided that was enough. Let me ask you this. Because I always like to ask, this is my signature question, so I'm going to take you back a little bit. I always like to ask All my right. guests this question because it's, sometimes it can give a window into who you are as an adult. What, what was Hugh like as a little boy, a little nipper? I mean, give us like three qualities, attributes, or characteristics that best describe you. What were you like? Well, I was always gay. Okay. That, 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 that's the, the first characteristic. Uh, the second characteristic, when I was like in the, the fourth and fifth grade, uh, I got bullied some mm. uh, and called sissy. Yeah. And somehow, I don't know why that stopped by the time I was uh, in... Uh, the seventh or eighth grade, I was getting along okay with other kids, right. but I never was good at sports. I was always the last kid chosen, so I oh. I felt kind of uh, I, I knew I was different. I had a similar experience, Hugh, so I can totally relate to that. Okay, so you always knew you were gay. Give me two more. Two more. Uh, uh, well, I, uh, I I was I was. Uh, I was terrible on the football field, but I was good in class. And I was always raising my hand for the, <laughs> for the teacher to call on me. Uh, so, so, so there was that. And my main thing was uh, hiking. I loved to walk. Uh, I, I, and that, that was something that you could do. And in those days in Wyoming, for instance, my, for my 12th birthday, I was given a 22 rifle. Really? And it was in the gun really? closet. And I could, anytime I could get 50 cents together to buy some some shells, I could take that rifle out of the closet and go into the the, the forest. We lived right right next to some woods and uh, and shoot. The, the only rule was don't shoot into town. Shoot away from town <laughs> because. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a good, that's, a, that's a damn good rule. <laughs> 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 so I, I, I was able to observe that rule. I love I was, that. I was an okay marksman with the Louis twenty two. So I, I can do things like that. Listen, I can see, I can see, I, I can see this now. Look, look, the black, a black family. The, the father said, "Look now, look, <laughs> now, this is black family. Now look, I got you this gun. You can shoot, but just don't don't shoot the town. Shoot over there. Just shoot, don't shoot the town." <laughs> <laughs> Yes, that, that was the kind of rule. You know, on, on this topic, why, uh, in Wyoming, where I grew up, there were not any black people, not one. Right. Zero black people. Right. Our minorities were uh, Native Americans. Oh, yeah. They were around. Certainly. Uh, a, a lot of people who were uh, not enrolled registra uh, reservation people, but, but had Native American ancestry. Mm -hmm. And we had uh, Mexican Americans, right, right. And so these were the two minorities. But we didn't have uh, in, in the state of Wyoming. There must be some black people, but they weren't where I lived, right. Uh, so, uh, so my exposure to black people came after I was growing up. Ah, uh, that well, yeah, that makes sense. That's yeah. Interesting. 
No. That makes sense. Okay, now we'll fast forward. Now, you said that at 20, the seminary was no longer your cup of tea. So I believe you became a cup reporter at the Salt Lake Tribune in Utah. And then sometime after that, you were drafted into the Army. So tell us about that experience. All right. Well, well, uh, uh, my my first job at the Salt Lake Tribune was on the Secretary of the Week beat. Oh. I was just fresh out of the seminary, you know. I mm. uh, at the seminary we we led really sheltered lives. We we didn't have daily newspapers, we didn't have television, and we didn't have girls. Uh, so so uh, so it was uh, a, a heart stopping adventure for me to walk up to a young woman and say, would you like to be secretary of the week? So mm. I had to work up my courage every week and find a secretary for that week. So that was my, my big adventure uh, at the Salt Lake Tribune. And then eventually I, I got a little bit better so I could write obituaries and write stories about the weather. Uh, but I, I wasn't doing any heavy duty reporting. Oh. Then I was drafted. And because I had some journalist, journalistic experience, the Army put me in an outfit called the Army Hometown News Center, mm. and it was in Kansas City. So they, they stationed me in Kansas City, and I wrote news releases to be sent to uh, the Army, uh, to, to the hometowns of, uh, of Army enlistees about what, uh, when they got promoted or when they uh, were on a, a, a training mission or something like that, anything that would be newsworthy. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that, that went on for two two years. And then I got out of the army and uh, I'd been working and being in the army all that time. While I was while I was there, I also worked at the Kansas City Star as I was in Kansas City. Now what time so I, what time frame more, what time frame was that? Okay, we're talking about nineteen sixty two to nineteen sixty four. Gotcha. When I was twenty two years old. Gotcha. Twenty four years old. And uh, so, uh, so I I didn't do very much during that period except work. Uh, I was not doing anything about my gay side. I I didn't know what to do, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, and was uh, the, this was before the don't ask, don't tell period of the army. Yeah, this was the the period when uh, when if if they caught you, you were out. Right. But they didn't catch me because I there wasn't anything to catch. I was I was uh, behaving myself. So after that, I I went to. Uh, Europe. Oh. I uh, bought a Volkswagen, a brand new Volkswagen for $800. $800? Uh, 1964. $800 is what it cost. Wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> wow. I can't. Okay. Well, these were the days when gasoline was 18 cents a gallon. Uh. So uh, the, the, the dollar went a long way. So, uh, so I, uh, I bought that in Frank, Frankfurt. And I was with a friend. We went to Vienna. We stayed in Vienna for a while, and we went to Budapest, and then we went to uh, Belgrade, and then we went to Bucharest, and then we went to Istanbul, and then we went to Athens. By this time, we're getting real tired of touring. Uh, the, uh, you, you see a lot of churches and a lot of museums, and they're very nice. They're wonderful. But uh, if you've done it for a few months, you're traveling and traveling and traveling. So, uh, so we took the ferry to... Brindisi and over to Naples and saw more museums and then drove up to Rome. And when we got to Rome, there was a newspaper there called the Rome Daily American. Oh. And it was a newspaper for expatriates and for tourists. Mm-hmm. The, uh, and so I uh, found out where their offices were and walked in and said, do you need anyone? They mm-hmm. hired me just like that. This, wow. this also was a beginner job. Beginner jobs were easy to get in those days. Exactly. So exactly. I, uh, there I was uh, living in Rome. I had an apartment and uh, was working for the Daily American. What I didn't know is that the Daily American was a CIA front. What? Really? Yep, that's right. Get the, out. the CIA owned the Daily American. What? And, <laughs> God, sabotage! I mean, uh, uh, this this is it. I mean that's sabot- This is intrigue. This is interesting. I was pr- practically a James Bond. But, you know, I they, spy. They, they didn't. They didn't meddle with the, the editorial side. Someone had to put out the 
newspaper. It was a regular daily newspaper. Uh, so they, uh, I, I didn't see any uh, any clover dagger stuff while I was there. So I only found out about that years later when I uh, when I read about it. So you didn't see Rob, you, you didn't see Robert Conrad and Bill Cosby over there, huh? <laughs> no, nothing, nothing like that. But it was fun being in, in Rome. I got to cover the the, the Vatican Council. Oh. Uh, that the Vatican Council had a meeting in the uh, the sixties, and so I got to cover some of that uh, wow. uh, church politics and you know, Catholic church politics. It was very important to me then because I was fresh out of the seminary. And the Catholic Church was very important to me. I, uh, I, I kind of have uh, let that go now. But at that time, it was a big part of my life. So I, I did that. But uh, there I was in Rome uh, and uh, feeling very lonely. Mm-hmm. My, my chum had departed, and I didn't know what to do. And things were looking very interesting back in the United States. The, mm-hmm. uh, about that time, there were all the student protests going on. The, something called, uh, at, at Berkeley, they had a movement called Freedom Under Car. Car. That was a ch- chancellor, and the, the initials for that were F-U-C-K. And they had uh, the conga dancing, and the beatniks were, uh, uh, were appearing in the news. And none of that was happening in Italy. So I wanted to be in uh, on part of that. I didn't know how to do it, but I wanted to find out. So I came back to the United States, I had to get a job. Mm-hmm. So I went back to Kansas City and worked for the Kansas City Star again. And then I uh, worked for a little while for a TV station. And by that time, uh, I was being more actively gay. You but I wasn't managing it very well. You know what? I found a very interesting quote, and I'm going to share it with you and the audience. You said this, and I quote about... Uh, missing the U.S. of A. and coming back. You said this, and I quote, but I had a problem, which was how to be gay. I was not out of the closet and was engaging in dangerous anonymous encounters. And if my secret were exposed, I would be out of a job, end quote. Now, Hugh, that's deep. Well, that's the way it was in the 1960s. Mm-hmm. This is before, uh, before the Stonewall Revolution and before the... I'm a big change in public opinion. Uh, it took a while. Uh, but in those days, it didn't matter. I knew a guy who worked as a salesman at a mattress store. He was fired. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't hold a job if you were known to be good. Mm. Mm. They would fire yeah. you. And the, the Kansas City Star certainly would fire you. They did fire people. But yeah. uh, the Midwest was losing all its young gay people, they'd, they'd go to San Francisco or they'd go to New York. Yeah, the they lavender lost a scare. Lot of talent that way. Yeah, right. Yeah. It was the, uh, the, the whole country was that way. Wow. The, the lavender scare was really in the 1950s, but it mm. wasn't over in the 1960s. It continued. Exactly, because... So you... anyway... No, please continue. Yeah, you know, so I, I I decided I had to get out of that game mm-hmm. because it was uh, I, I needed to figure out how to uh, how to live as a gay person. Sure. And to do that, I needed uh, financial security to begin with. I had to have a, a job. Mm-hmm. So my job was a GI Bill. Ah. I, mean, I, I never had finished my uh, my college work, so I wanted to do that. And so I went back to uh, to uh, school and finished a bachelor's degree at the University of Missouri. And then my my plan was to continue to be a, a reporter, but I got so interested in my studies that I wanted to continue them. Okay. So I went to the University of Kansas that's in Lawrence. So I'm staying in the, in the Midwest all this time. Mm-hmm. And I met the University of Kansas and then teaching Latin because my Latin is really strong. My Greek is not that great, mm-hmm. but, but I'm a good Latinist, uh, thanks to the monks at Mount Angel mm-hmm. uh, and, and the six years that I was there. So I was teaching Latin, and I got a fellowship to come to, to New York. Oh. And that, that, that was when I was 30. That was 1970. Okay. I came to New York in 1970, and New York was a new world. 
it was really what I had looked for all, all along. There were the gay people openly. You could see them on the street. You could talk to them. And uh, you could have gay friends. And uh, you could go to gay places. And there were gay plays and uh, gay dances. Uh, all kinds of gay stuff that uh, was brand new to me. And a lot of sexual opportunities, too, that were very important. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I, uh, I lived the student life for another uh, 10 years or so, and that was a lot of fun, but the, the GI Bill eventually gave out, so uh, I had to do something else. Okay. And I, mm -hmm. I, I made the switch then to uh, the, be a computer programmer, mm -hmm. and computer programming is a, a perfectly fine way to make a living. It wasn't, it wasn't as exciting and as much fun as some of the things I've done it. But it has its fun side. Uh, but it's useful. The people need to have their computers work, and they need to get their reports, things like that, for business. So I, I did that and made a living and stayed in New York. And eventually I uh, was able to retire. And when I retired, I returned to my, uh, my love of academic work mm -hmm. and looked around for things to do. And what I saw was there was a need for history of the gay and lesbian movement. Mm. I had been witnessing the, what the gay and lesbian people were up to for, uh, for all those years. Well, I wanted mm. to write about it, so I, I, I began to write about it. So that, that's how I came to be a, a historian. I was, I was never uh, trained as a gay and lesbian historian. I was trained as a classical historian. Oh, okay. Lots, lots of gay stuff in the classics. But uh, anyway, that, that, that's what I did. Uh, I was particularly interested in original documents mm -hmm. like uh, the Gay Guides for 1949. That just exists in two copies, and I had one of them. So I, uh, I transcribed it and published it as a book. Okay. Before, so we, that, before we get deeper into your YouTube content in your, your book, uh, that I really want to focus on. I have to ask you this question. When you when you uh, got to New York in 1970, eventually you formed a relationship, a 35-year relationship. Um, uh, what, yes. What is the secret sauce for two gay, same-gender loving men to be in a relationship that lasts that long? Tell us. Well, I, uh, the, the secret sauce is that I couldn't do without him. Uh, we, mm. It was a, a relationship that had stormy moments. And there were times when I felt I can't continue with this. Right. And, uh, I, uh, and uh, uh, would not see him for a while. Uh, but I got so lonely I couldn't stand it. And... So, uh, so I, so I'd call him up, and uh, and he he was lonely too. So, so, so it was hard. I, I'm not saying that I, that I was always easy, <laughs> but but when I'm what I'm remembering are not the times that, that I gave him a hard time. The times that he gave me a hard time. Still, the, the there were a lot of wonderful moments, mainly wonderful moments. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the 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 really emotional moments that stand out in your mind are not always the the best ones, uh, but the uh, it was a a really sustaining, fulfilling, fulfilling relationship that went on and on. So I miss him a lot because he's deceased now, I believe. Correct? Yeah, he he he, he passed away uh, in nineteen twenty in, in twenty twenty one. Uh, it was. Not COVID. He had um, uh, uh, several uh, health conditions, and not, I'm not sure exactly which one of them it was that did him in. But uh, it was uh, it, 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 he was hard on his body. So, right. Um, so it, it wore off. I am so sorry to hear that. Um, yeah, but you. It, it was sad. And you, you know, you have these. Well, I'm glad that I had. Him. We had that relationship for all those years. Uh, th this year, I'm uh, uh, finishing a, a story about uh, my friend, and uh, I'm I, every every year at Christmas time, I write a story 
just to give to my family and, and close friends. So this year I'm writing about him. So that is, that, that's helpful for me. Absolutely. Nice touch. And you have great memories and, you know, that secret sauce that I was, that I mentioned, ingredients are effective communication and compromise. Because if you don't have that, there's no way that you can have a fulfilling, loving relationship. I think. I know you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Okay. Thank you, Hugh, for sharing that. Let us move on to your content because, like I said, old school gays. You really do such a wonderful job exploring and dissecting um, um, politics, culture of LGBTQ, you know, life in the 20th century, the last century. The first video I want to focus on is titled Gay Crimes, Loitering, Vagrancy, Disorderly Conduct. And you point out how a variety of offenses were used to keep us in line, to persecute us, and the resulting public shaming was like a scarlet letter on your head. So let's talk about that. Well, you were actually ruined if, uh, if, if you got, uh, got arrested for one of those crimes because the newspapers would publish your name. And, and there it was, and uh, uh, you couldn't hold your hand up in the community, and uh, you couldn't keep a job. It was terrible. And also, too, you know, during that time, 40s, 50s, and, the, and 60s, I mean, we were, you had gay people set up um, by cops, for example, like in public places, bathrooms, that sort of thing, um, to, oh, entra yes. to entrap people as well. Yes, the famous one is Mansfield, Ohio. And if uh, you are on YouTube, you can find lots of videos from Mansfield, Ohio on it. What they did was, uh, and, uh, Mansfield is a, a, a smallish town. Okay. Uh, and it has a, a park downtown that we call Central Park, and it had a men's room uh, that was uh, uh, down an incline and a little bit buried. Uh, and the police department, installed a camera down in the men's room that was disguised as a paper towel dispenser. <laughs> and uh, and it was a, a tea room where men carried on. Right. So they they would get all these, uh, uh, this film. Then they would follow people as they exited and get their driver's licenses so as to be able to get identifications. Uh -huh. And they had a lot of arrests for a small town. It was like... Uh, 50 or 75 arrests, many arrests. Mm -hmm. And the, the judges were uh, very unsympathetic. And so uh, so the, the people who were uh, filmed in, in those uh, uh, those situations that were, were really in a world of trouble. I don't know exactly how they managed to pick things up and get started again, but, the, uh, but, but that was real common. And there were decoys. Uh, and, and that happens all the time. You know, that the, the, a U.S. Senator, Larry Craig, right. uh, was arrested in the, the Minneapolis airport. Right. And uh, he, he, he was in a, a men's room, and he was in uh, one of the, the, the stalls. And who should be in the next stall but a detective? Right. I remember that. So. <laughs> I remember that. Poor, poor Mr. Craig. <laughs> Wasn't that in the nineties or something? Or no, it was in, it was in uh, uh, around 2010, 2010, oh, uh, 2010. 29 or twenty ten. It hasn't been that long. Right. Whoa. And he, uh, and, and he, uh, he 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 was on his way home. He uh, he wanted to get out of there as quick as he could, so he just signed what they gave him to sign. He thought, "I'll send in a hundred dollar check, and that'll be it." But the newspapers picked it up and uh, and published it. And then he said, oh, uh, I want to take my guilty plea back. And mm -hmm. the judge said, no, uh, your guilty plea stands. We don't we don't let you take guilty plea, but please back. You said you uh, understood it, and uh, now it's too late. And uh, and Craig said, well, I'm not gay anyway. Uh, so uh, and, and maybe he's not. You know, there are. Uh, 
there, there's no card carrying test for who's gay and who's not. Just because you frequent tea rooms doesn't necessarily mean you're gay, does it? <laughs> so I don't know. What do you have to do to be gay? Uh, the, the... Uh, oh, and you know what? And then you had the Boise, Idaho thing of 1955 where you had professional men who... who are, uh, yeah, the professional men who were supposedly sleeping with underage boys or teens or whatever, and then oh yeah, that that, that was a big scandal. The boys of Boise, right? And there was a, 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 a JFK's uh, uh, chief of staff, Walter Jenkins, uh, was arrested at uh, in the, the YMCA men's room in Washington. Yeah, uh, that that was the old YMCA. Yeah, it, and that was the second time he'd been arrested there. He, the first time he just paid a fine, and that was the end of it. The second time uh, was during the Johnson administration when Walter Jenkins was more famous. The, 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 this was happening to not hundreds, but thousands, maybe tens of thousands of men through all those years. And only a few cases got in the newspapers because they were famous. Mm -hmm. And there were a lot of people who weren't famous whose name got in the newspaper and uh, and uh, were uh, were injured that way, but uh, but anyway, Walter Jenkins, uh, what was uh, I, I think it was uh, disorderly conduct. I'd have to look it up. But these were minor charges. They were uh, trifling charges, and uh, the the they had small fines and very rarely a, a jail time. Although uh, the, um, the was the, the, the civil rights guy who was uh, Martin Luther King's oh uh, uh, Bayard uh, Rustin yeah Bayard, Bayard, Bayard Rustin uh, spent a couple of months in jail right for, uh, for exactly that so, it, uh, so, so so it's hard yeah and you know with that Boise Idaho thing in 1955 I think some of the people that were penalized actually were innocent I think it was just such an I think. If you were associated with certain people, they would come down on you. It was just, those were the days. You could get in trouble just for having a, a, a physique magazines in your house. They'd, they, they'd get a warrant, they'd raid and arrest you for it. That's what I want to talk about next because your video entitled Beefcake Behind Bars, Physique physique mags in the law 1940s through 1967 and you stated this and i quote of all the publications on the rack nothing was more dangerous than the muscle mags they were ostensibly about strength and health and bodybuilding but in fact delivered a very different message end quote that's ominous so let's talk about that this is the perfect segue well, the, 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 the producers of those muscle magazines knew very well what they were producing, and the consumers knew what they wanted to consume, mm -hmm. uh, but they had to get around the postal laws. The, the Comstock laws were still in, in effect, and it was uh, Comstock was a, a 19th century crusader against birth control and uh, any kind of sexual activity. Comstock uh, had books seized medical books that had anatomical drawings mm -hmm. because they uh, because they showed body parts that he disapproved of so uh, and so that that was the level of uh, vigilance that Comstock uh, promoted and uh, Comstock got a special uh, law passed the, the Comstock laws and then he was the postal he ran the postal inspection system for a long while when the postal inspectors were still busy in the 1950s, mm -hmm. and they would cooperate with the, the local police forces, and uh, they'd get warrants and they'd make raids, and that happened to a whole bunch of the people who were producing the beefcake magazines. Wow. And they, uh, they, they, I don't think any of them. Well, yes, uh, Bob Miser did time on the county farm, and he might have done more time and kind. Of, uh, kind of lost it over in his uh, biography. Uh, but mainly they did uh, uh, fines and their property was destroyed and, uh, and their, uh, their cameras were broken and their uh, negatives were smashed, things like that. Mm. It was very brutal. 
Wow. And these were were uh, were the images that were very careful about not showing the genitals. Mm -hmm. They the uh, you know, the beefcake period. The models would be in posing straps. You know what those posing straps are? They're very skimpy, mm -hmm. but <laughs> but yeah, still, yeah. They, uh, <laughs> they uh, quite skimpy. Thank God for that. <laughs> well, that's what that's what the customers wanted. Anyway, the mm -hmm. the, the the it was uh, of of course a lucrative business for a while. Uh, those producers would make uh, prints and sell them uh, individually. Instead of putting them in the mail, they would uh, uh, put a whole bunch of them. They'd have a customer list, and they'd, uh, uh, they'd put them in the car uh, and drive out and deliver them to the customers. Uh, uh, that is an expensive way to, uh, to, to uh, do uh, your distribution, but it doesn't get you in jail. And so, uh, so they, they would do that. Well, always a satisfied and customer, right? Wow. <laughs> there, okay. were, there were some wonderful photographers in the 1950s. Some of them did not get in trouble. Uh, my favorite one of all is uh, called Pat Milo. And he worked in California. And he did wonderful, sensitive character studies in the nude, uh, but, uh, and, and very hot, too. Uh, but he, he, uh, he never got arrested. How he managed to, to avoid that, I don't know. But, but he... Uh, he, he stayed out of trouble and produced those uh, pictures, and, and some others did too. But the ones that I talked about in the clip are the ones that I know about that got in trouble with the law. Okay. What I want to do is get into your intriguing book, Hugh, called G.I. Hustlers of World War II. And the synopsis states that I quote, the draft of World War II tore 10 million men from the arms of their sweethearts all oh, and deposited them lonely, horny, and broke in the big cities. They were made, there they made a wonderful discovery. The red light districts were full of friendly strangers who might offer a GI a cigarette, buy him a drink or a dinner, put him up for the night, shower him with affection, and even help him out with a few bucks, end quote. This is underground history, so to speak. Tell us about that. Well, the, the, the regular term is military prostitution, and it's a very old story. Uh, oh. It uh, goes back to uh, the, uh, probably as long as there have been the organized militias in, mm -hmm. in Europe. In antiquity, they, uh, they, they didn't do that because uh, there was not such a... a uh, an oppression of gay people, so that, that what wasn't hard, wasn't so hard to find uh, gay partners. But mm -hmm. by the time uh, the uh, military, the European militaries came along, mm -hmm. uh, you had all these uh, great-looking young men, uh, unattached and broke, and uh, it was a, a perfect opportunity for uh, that certain. Uh, gentlemen of a certain means and age to uh, uh, to uh, to make acquaintances, so they did, and it was good for both sides. And there there are lots of examples of that in in, uh, in Europe and in England. It was uh, it was common, and in the United States, someone like um, uh, Jenny June, uh, the, the New York trans transsexual of the late nineteenth century, yeah. hung out in barracks all the time. She had two whole barracks, and they, they would cheer her at uh, football games, three cheers for Jenny June. Uh, and uh, and she, she was just an outrageous uh, 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 trans, transvestite. Uh, uh, she, she really was a transsexual. Uh, it was bef before the, the days of surgery, but she, uh, she, was, she identified as, as a woman. She said, I have a woman's soul in a man's body. Anyway, it was real common and it's discussed uh, a lot in uh, the 1930s by James Jones, the mm. novelist who wrote uh, the From Here to Eternity. Uh, you, you probably know about that movie. It's a famous movie right. with Frank Sinatra right. and the Montgomery Clift mm -hmm. and the Deborah Carr and and, uh, and who else? Uh, Ernest Borgnine, uh, a, a big staff. 
a, hmm. a big cast. Uh, and the, why, the, the novel as he wrote it, as James Jones wrote it, had the, the Frank Sinatra character as a hustler. Uh, he, he had uh, a favorite fellow in, in Honolulu who, uh, who took care of him. And all that got blue penciled out by the editors at uh, James Jones's uh, publishing company. I think it was uh, not. Uh, they, they just, uh, and the, the manuscript was saved. So it, it, uh, James Jones's daughter, who's also a novelist, published it. And you, uh, you can see the, uh, the manuscript with the, uh, the parts crossed out that, uh, that uh, James Jones wrote, but that uh, Knopf would not, uh, uh, would not print. And uh, it, it's all there. So that, that went on uh, all, all during the 1930s. Mm. It was really a matter of the professional army, though. The, the, when the draft came along and they, the, the army increased in size for, for World War II, and the army increased in size exponentially, they had like millions of men that had to, they had to do something with. And the, 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 they, they didn't want to spend all their resources on policing their sexuality. If they, if they didn't get into, into, into trouble, the commanders were not inclined to look for trouble. Uh. So, so, so that, that, that is how that went. So, so long as everybody was discreet mm. and, and didn't get and, and, uh, arrested by the, by the civilian authorities, mm -hmm. uh, it was man, mainly tolerated. Not, not encouraged, but overlooked. Very interesting. See, this, this, these are slices. I, I, these are slices of history and culture that a lot of people don't know about, and you are bringing them to the forefront. I really appreciate. That. I don't know what it's like now. It, it probably is very different. But I had a friend who I uh, lived in Las Vegas who told me that he used to have lots of friends at Nellis Air Force Base, and uh, so. So the, the, the same thing was going on. That was in the, the 1970s. And I, I think it'll uh, probably go forever. But anyway, it was happening then. Hmm. Interesting. Although when I was in the Army, I didn't see anything like that, I, I have to say. The, 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 no sugar daddy was propositioning me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't in the right place. <laughs> you, you have to be. You have to be in the right place. I get it. Right place at the right time. There you go. <laughs> it's all about luck. <laughs> okay. Well, it really is. Before we end, and thank you for such a fascinating conversation, my friend, I want to talk about, we're both men of a certain age, so I want to talk about aging in the LGBTQ plus community um, and the challenges that we face. First of all, you're part of SAGE, of the SAGE Harlem Center, which provides a safe space for LGBTQ plus older adults in Harlem. So first of all, tell us about uh, Sage Harlem. Well, I can't speak highly enough about Sage Harlem. It's just a wonderful organization. It has been uh, a, a great resource for me. I've been lonely since I lost my, my uh, companion and I needed a way to get out. I'm not going any longer to the bars, uh, but, the, the baths are closed down. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, don't don't go to the discos, so I don't have a lot of opportunities. Uh, I actually I like to be in bed at nine thirty. <laughs> so I, I, I get it. I don't have this I, I get it. I, listen, sometimes I, listen. I get it. Sometimes I feel the same way. I get it. I get it. <laughs> so I, I I I need to have a, an opportunity to meet other gay men. And that is what Sage provides for me. Uh -huh. They've got a men's discussion group on Fridays. That is more fun than I can tell you. Uh, there are maybe a dozen guys there at most meetings, uh -huh. and they're interesting guys. They're sharp guys. We talk about all kinds of things. The the, the doors are closed, so it's just us, and we, uh, we we can say what's on our mind, and you know what's on our mind. Uh, so uh, so we, you know, we we really do that. But besides that. Uh, which is very important. Sage also has uh, social services. Oh, great! They help people they 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 provide vaccinations. I get my COVID vaccinations there. I get my flu vaccinations there. They have 
counselors if uh, you need uh, uh, help with uh, finding a place to live, or uh, you have social workers who will uh, walk you through things like that. So they, they, they really are a very worthwhile organization and doing a lot of good work. I see that they have just launched uh, uh, a national, Sage USA has just launched uh, a website. Oh, good. It has a lot of buttons on it. I, I don't think it's really working very well yet because I logged on and, and nothing much was happening. <laughs> but I, <laughs> Do you know the website address? Uh, yes. Let, let me see. I should have. I'm not going to find it now, but it's Sage. Well, I I misplaced that magazine. I have I had an ad for it, but I can't give it to you right now. But anyway, it's Sage hyphen C E N T S Sage Sense. Okay. Dot org. Or, or, or go to Sage Sage dot org Sage USA dot org. That's that's what you want to do. Okay, Sage um, uh, USA dot org. Right. Correct. Right. So Let's so go, it's go there. S A G E. Well, because you know this is. S-A-G-E-U-S-A dot org. Got it. Uh, and you'll, you'll find resources. Uh, it's uh, it's all very well but for me. I'm in New York. For you, you're in Washington. There mm. are lots of resources available to you and me. But if you're in uh, uh, Des Moines or you're in uh, Casper, Wyoming, or you're in uh, Abilene, or you're in uh, New Orleans, or, or you know, you're in Baton Rouge or mm -hmm. you know, lots of places, you do not have the kind of resources that are available to you and me, which is uh, uh, really bad. And so uh, right. that, that, that is another reason that the, 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 the gay people who fled the podunk towns and, and went to the big, were attracted by the lights of the big, big city. Uh, now, now they, uh, there's a payoff. Or, uh, mm -hmm. that, uh, there, these big cities have gay communities that uh, you don't find in Boise or Billings. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, so, so, so that that's the main thing I'd say. Sage USA and Sage New York and probably Sage DC. I haven't checked it out, but I'm I'm sure there is one. Is a really worthwhile organization. Oh, and they have. The young volunteers, too. It turns out that there are young people right. in the gay community who mm -hmm. like helping their elders. And so mm -hmm. you see them there. They, they, uh, and they have uh, home visitation, things like that. Very, very worthwhile. So I, I recommend really, that. I'm really glad, and thank you for sharing that information. Okay, question for you, Hugh. What can we do to lift up our senior LGBTQ plus members, individuals, what are things we can do to help? Well, it, 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 it's really tough to be old, to tell you the truth, Wyatt, uh, right. whether you're LGBTQ or not. Uh, exactly. Uh, you have a, a lot of issues. Being old is a full-time occupation. And uh, so, so so there is that. What, what you, how, how to... Uh, support our uh, our elders. I don't know. I mean, uh, the, uh, have have more <laughs> have more afternoon events at the attend. I suppose <laughs> so more, more social events, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I I, I think mm -hmm. I think social things are very very important. They uh, are so uh, so uh, and they're important for everybody. But it's easier for young people than right. it is for uh, for for elders. Right. So, so uh, that that is is one thing I would commend the young people for doing if they uh, make a, an effort to reach out to the the gay elders and where 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 are the gay elders to be found? Well, there a lot of them uh, at home watching TV and never get out, mm -hmm. and that that's bad. Uh, that, that there should be encouragement for them to get out and places for them to go, and so. Uh, I'm, uh, th th this is all very vague what I'm talking about, but still, uh, some something like the Sage uh, group that I attend is what I I would like to see replicated for a lot. 
Then another thing is uh, the assisted living situations. Uh, uh, there are some, yeah. some, some, some retirement uh, uh, communities for gay people. But uh, I, I know a gay person who is in uh, uh, the big retirement village and uh, retirement community in Washington, in Florida called the Villages. I don't know whether you've ever heard of it, but it's, I have, it's enormous. Yeah. It goes over right. three, three counties. It's the biggest retirement community. Uh, it's mm-hmm. very Republican and very straight. Oh. The, 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 there is no, uh, no gay community to speak of in the Villages. Oh. that anyone can find. Wow. Uh, there are some bars in Florida, but that's not the same thing as a, a community for uh, for gay elders. Absolutely. So that, uh, the, but there needs to be more uh, focus on, the, on the centers that uh, gay people can retire to where there will be other gay people where you can sit, sit around and talk about gay things. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that is... Uh, that, that is my, my thought on that. You need that sense of community. I, I totally get that. Oh, yeah, very, very important. You know, the, the straight people are fine. I have nothing against straight people, but I don't want to spend all my time with them. No, <laughs> you really don't. I feel, I, I feel you. I, I totally get that. <laughs> Listen. How can we connect with you? Give us all of your social media. Well, uh, the, the, the main thing is I am on uh, on YouTube and I have the YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. Uh, those clips that I do take me a little while to put together. So I uh, will be uh, publishing uh, maybe uh, one, uh, one every month or so. Mm-hmm. And that, that's about the pace I can work at. And that's, that's where you'll see me. I, I have a Facebook account, but I have not been posting very much on Facebook. I look at the, the posts put there by my Facebook friends. Oh. But, I haven't, but I've been putting all my effort into, into the YouTube channel. Got so it. That's, what, that's, that's where my... Well, and, Ms. Uh, if you look at my YouTube channel, do not forget to uh, leave a comment because I, I like the comments and I respond to most of the comments. What, what's no, there are a few hostile comments. People t- that tell me that I'm a, <laughs> that, that, that this is degenerate trash and things like that. I get those messages, but not very many. Mainly it's positive. And you know, an interesting thing about that YouTube channel is that you know this because you're on YouTube. Uh, you can see what your demographics are on. Yeah, YouTube. I love it. Who is watching? Yeah, that's very, very interesting. Well, my demographics are 95% men good and okay uh, they are yeah you know, they are the 85 percent the over 65 so who who are, who who are looking at my clips are geezers yay geezers and that is just fine about half half of them are uh in the united states and uh, about half of them are in other countries mainly in english-speaking countries but but anyway that, that I, I i do like hearing comments and knowing about others. And so that is uh, that, that is useful for me. Well, Hugh, let me say this. Being a degenerate is laudable. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> being a degenerate <laughs> is laudable. <laughs> At least it's exciting. It's a lot of fun being degenerate. I yes, really enjoy it. it is. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Mr. Hugh Hagius, thank you so much for stopping by. Wyatt, you must come back. I had a blast. It's, it's been a pleasure. And let me tell you what I'm working on now. Oh, uh, I have been uh, uh, attending a, an LGBT uh, history seminar that's conducted by a guy at, uh, at SAGE. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm learning from uh, the other attendees. I'm interested in particularly in minority groups in within the gay community. Okay. And the two minority groups I'm working on now and working up clips on are butch lesbians mm. and uh, uh, and uh, black leather men. The, 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 there is a, a whole community of black men in the Yeah, leather. definitely. And 
And, and of course, we, uh, we know that there are lots of butch lesbians. Mm -hmm. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be working up the clips on that. So I, I think that that is an interesting aspect because, you know, you've got minorities within minorities and sometimes mm -hmm. minorities within minorities within minorities are getting uh, quite fine slices in some of these distinctions, but they're very important and, uh, and that people identify with. So I am interested in, in pursuing that kind of avenue. Wonderful. Well, Hugh, thank you, and please come back. Thanks, Wyatt. Lots of fun to talk to you. Likewise, and I my like friend. the channel. Thank you so much. Good to talk to you. Okay. Have a good one. You too. Yeah. So, y'all, there you have it. You can find the official Wyatt podcast page at wyattevans.com, the go to a destination for LGBTQ plus news, features, commentary, and entertainment. WyattEvans.com is visited by more than 100 countries on the regular. All I can say to that is, hey, baby. And at WyattEvans.com, you'll find my smoking hot, H-A-W-T hot, Nothing Can Tear Us Apart series of novels. And as you just saw on the top, the newest installment is called Shattered! I say it, Shattered. And y'all, Shattered is full of, of, of action, danger, intrigue, sexually charged situations, passion, and all of the wonderful elements that you're used to in the Nothing Can Tear Us Apart series of novels. So get your new copy of Shattered. Now, you can follow me, your host, Wyatt O'Brien Evans, all across social media, and poof, is right there for you to peruse, like TikTok and Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And if you have any comments or whatever, you can hit me up at wyattonair at gmail.com. So until next time, y'all, woof, goddammit, woof, 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 I said... Wolf.